So, Lockdown K releases a video called What Actually Happened to Every One-Hit Wonder in NBA History. And I saw some names in the thumbnail, some players in the thumbnail, that I think will bring us back to memory lane, man. God! What happened to these guys? What happened, man? Hold on. Goes to music with people like Sheck West, GS Boys with Stanky Leg, or Vanilla Ice. But one hit wonders don't only happen in music, they happen in the NBA too. From stretches of going from a nobody to a superstar within a week, to people peaking within their first game only to never top it again. These players mm. thought they had it all figured out, but really they were far from it. So let, let me let me let me name a couple off rip, man. Let me let me name a couple off rip. Jeremy Lin. Number one, obviously. Um, who else? Why am I already fucking blanking on names, dog? Fuck. Michael Carter Williams. Michael Carter Williams is another one. Um, Andre Ingram is another one. Shout out to Andre Ingram. Who? Who? Yo, who was that? Small last point guard for the Mavs that was cooking motherfuckers for like a couple weeks. Not Ru not Rudy Boubois or whatever the fuck his his name is. I, I'm blank. I'm blanking on bro bro's name, but that guy. And uh, can I name a big? Can I name a big? <sighs> Hassan Whiteside. Hassan, y'all yo, <laughs> remember when Hassan Whiteside first came came onto the scene, bro? That was that was crazy. But let's find out what actually happened to these one, hit, one hit wonder. But. Why did they fall off and where are they now? You cannot talk about one hit wonders without talking about Michael Carter Williams. So MCW gets taken by the Sixers in 2013, right at the start of the process. You know, that time when Sam Hankey was collecting draft picks like Pokemon? Yeah, that process. My guy looked at LeBron and the Heatles like a meal and he ate, dropping nearly a quadruple double with 22 points, 12 dimes, 7 boards, and get this, 9 steals. It was like dude was playing on 2K rookie mode and had the perfect my career moment. All season long, Michael Carter Williams was putting up numbers, and he showed flashes of brilliance in his rookie campaign. His incredible size for the position, combined with his length and passing ability, made him a matchup nightmare on a nightly basis. That skill set also made him a dog on the defensive side of the floor. He ended that season averaging 16, 6, and 6, something that only Magic Johnson and Oscar Robertson did as rookies. So it was no surprise when MCW ran away with Rookie of the Year award, and for a while, Philly fans were all in on the 6 6 guard. I mean, you had a two way point who could push it in transition and mock in on defense. I mean, sure, the team was taking L's, and yeah, the fish. I, I was never high on Mark Carter Williams. Side note, his ankle looks like he's about to get fucked up right there. <laughs> oh my god. I was, I was never, e even after that one game, I'm like, mm. ah. I guess. Efficiency was awful, but Philly had their next star, right? Well, I, I saw Sean really. Livingston you see, at best. playing on a team like the Process Sixers is Livingston a double-edged sword. You get to shine, sure, but it's like being the best player on a pickup team. Yeah, you might be a little nice, but you really ain't playing for much. Pretty soon, the injury bug hits MCW and the league starts changing. As the NBA evolved, his style didn't fit the mold anymore and his weaknesses got exposed. After all, an inefficient guard without a jumper is dang near unplayable in today's league. But actually, when he got to Milwaukee, he had an opportunity. With Jason Kidd at the helm, MCW had a coach who saw himself in the young guard. But still, he couldn't find the consistency in a lineup that had very little spacing. Eventually, J Kid opted to put the ball in the hands of a young Giannis Antetokounmpo, oh, and the yeah, rest is history. <laughs> After that, MCW never really got to play the position that won him Rookie of the Year. He bounced from team to team to team and was never able to capture the magic of that first season. So, what's up with MCW now? He's out there grinding the G League, trying to adapt to a league Dang, that's changed since his debut. But that rookie season is like MCW's hit single that still gets run. Nobody's really messing with the album, but dang, the first track will always be straight fire. Yeah, but like, just the first track of your debut album is crazy. Like, <laughs> cause I, I'm gonna be honest, I don't, I don't remember anything else from that rookie season outside from that opening game, bro. If you ever find yourself watching Venezuelan pro basketball, you might come across another hooper who took the league by storm as a rookie. I'm talking about Tyreek Evans. So check this, it's 2009 and a 6'6 point guard with a ridiculous handle steps on the floor for the Sacramento Kings. And let me tell y'all, my guy was hoop hooping. Tyreek's handle for his size was elite. I'm talking like and one baller type of special. 
but what really separated him was his ability to find creases in the defense and get to the rim. His acrobatic finishes almost reminded you of Kyrie. That season, he led the Kings to one of the biggest comebacks in NBA history. When they came back from- Now, Tyreek Evans, I actually thought he was him. I, I, I will say that. Rookie, rookie season Tyreek Evans, I really thought he was him. And he still had a couple good years in the league too. It wasn't like, it wasn't like his whole career was just flop after the rookie season. But, damn. I thought he was going to be one of them ones, man. I thought he was, damn. From 35 points down to beat prime Derrick Rose in the Bulls. As a rookie, he outscored the Bulls by himself in the fourth quarter. Tyreek wasn't just playing games, he was setting records. Just check the numbers. He was the fourth rookie in NBA history to put up 25 and 5. It was Oscar, it was Jordan, it was LeBron, and it was Tyreek. That's the kind of company he was keeping, so it wasn't surprising when he won Rookie of the Year, beating out players like Steph Curry, James Harden, DeMar DeRozan, and Drew Holiday. Damn, so hey. what happened? Well, it's a mixture of things. A foot injury hampered his development in his second season, but he still put up pretty put good numbers. The main reason Tyreek didn't become the star he probably should have been is pretty simple. Sacramento fans don't hate me, but the Kings were a poverty franchise. Oh, year shit. after year, Sacramento found themselves drafting in the lottery, and for some odd reason, they kept taking guards who would eat into Tyreek's minutes at the one. Marcus Thornton, Jimmer Fredette, and Isaiah Thomas all spent time playing the position that Tyreek played best. And playing off the ball highlighted his weaknesses, mainly his lack of a consistent jumper. And in a league where three-point shooting was becoming more and more important, it really hurt his value. It took Tyreek years to learn how to be effective and efficient while playing off the ball. And by the time he developed yeah, that jumper, that it was a little too late for hand. stardom. See, in the NBA, circumstances matter. And sometimes even the greatest talents can't overcome a bad situation. Well, don't get me wrong. Tyreek Evans still had a solid career, but he never reached the heights expected of him after that crazy rookie year. His story remains a mixture of, oh yeah, he's him. And what happened? If your career highlight is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kobe Bryant in the playoff series, then you must be an all-star at the very least, right? Well, for the next man on our list, that's not exactly true. Like every baller, Aaron Brooks' career is more than just a highlight reel. It's a story of highs and lows, and sometimes the NBA just ain't fair. All right, let's rewind a bit. Aaron Brooks starts his NBA journey like any other late round first pick. He's grinding, he's hustling, Big just Aaron waiting Brooks. for the chance to show what he's got. And by the end of his sophomore season, he's already turning heads. See, Houston starting point guard Riffer Alston gets traded. Was Aaron Brooks a one and done like that, though? I thought it was a solid, like, he had a solid amount of years in the league. And I don't even think he had that one burst of him being like that. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay, never mind, never mind. He, he did have that one burst. <laughs> Yeah, 20 points on, yeah. But I, I always thought he was just a solid guard in the league. I don't, I never thought he was anything crazy. Um, Aaron Brooks is money in 2K, though. I, hey, 2K13 2K off the bench. Aaron Brooks, 81 overall. Cash money from three, dog. To the magic Cash and brooks steps in as the starter for the final 28 games of the season and let me tell you dude was a straight bucket especially from deep by the time the 09 playoffs rolled around for houston there was no tracy mcgrady or yao ming to lean on they were sidelined with injuries it was aaron brooks who dropped 34 on the mamba and took the lakers to seven the very same lakers that would go on to win the nba title that's not just skilled that takes guts I fast forward to the next aaron season brooks and now, brooks hits but... a whole nother level scoring over 19 a game and he led the league in three pointers made while shooting dang near 40 percent from deep those I, are I curry type numbers before curry this isn't just okay now we gotta relax now we gotta relax now 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 we gotta relax now <laughs> Shout out to Aaron Brooks. But 40% on six threes a game. Leading the league in three-pointers made is not Curry-like numbers before Curry. Do I need to remind people what Curry-like numbers are? No, I don't. You just stop it right there. Just a player finding his rhythm. This is a man rewriting right his NBA there. story. He went from being the supporting cast to the lead act and the main attraction. And that was enough to earn him the 2010 Most Improved Player Award. But in the NBA, things change and life comes at you fast. Sometimes it really is a next man up league. Just as quick as he was able to get that starting job, it was taken away. The very next season, all it took to end Aaron Brooks' run was a sprained ankle. Sure, he had a slow start, but while he's out, a young guard named Kyle Lowry steps in and steps up. 
Brooks comes back, but the script was already changed. The rocket shipped into Phoenix and those bright lights started to fade quickly, but Brooks kept grinding. He hopped from Phoenix to Denver to Chicago and even had another stint in Houston. He still had the skills, he still had the speed and the shot, but his role changed. He never got to be the leading man again, he was back to being the supporting cast. It's a tough pill, but it's life. Now, Brooks has swapped his jersey for a clipboard. He's an assistant with the Westchester Knicks in Ojeeli. He went from lighting up Kobe to guiding the next generation. Nothing, it's nothing a full circle that, moment. Nothing his run back that. in 2012 was a testament to his talent, but his current role, well, that speaks volume about his love for the game. Sometimes the NBA just ain't fair. And for Brooks, that breakout season will always be a part of NBA lore. But the real story, the one we talk about now, it's about adaptability, resilience, and finding your role in a league that's always changing. Let's throw it back to the 90s real quick and talk about a man who was a basketball prophet, showing us a glimpse of the future before we even knew it was coming. In the early 90s, Dana Barrows was considered a tweener. He had the skill set of a two guard, but the body of a point. See, back then, point guards were more traditional. If you played point, you were a playmaker first, score second. I, I, I do wonder that though, the the role player, because there there's players in the past that we can make assumptions as to, oh, they're going to dominate in this league, right? Or dominate even more, dominate even less, whatever. But I do want to find out the role player who would be a superstar in today's league. You know what I'm saying? And, and it works in the reverse as well. Who's who's the role player in today's league that would have been a superstar back then? Because I do think there's a select few, not a lot, but a select few that legitimately just played in the wrong era. But if they played in the right one, their their career does a 180. Now, I don't know Dana Barrows enough to say that that's him. But I don't know. This is it's interesting to me. Like Rod Strickland, he might be one of them ones. He might be one of them ones. I don't know. Truthfully, the NBA was not ready for his game. He spent his first four years as a role player in Seattle, averaging single digits. And his first year in Philly was pretty decent. In the 90s, most believed that taking threes was inefficient, but not Dana Barros. The one thing he always had going for him was an absolutely deadly three-point shot, and when the 94-95 season rolled around, Barros really leveled up. Playing 40 minutes a game, dude averaged nearly 21 points and 7.5 dimes on 46% from three. Okay, to put that into perspective, not even Steph Curry himself has shot that high of a percentage from deep. Dana Barros really paved the way for dudes like Steph, Dame, and Trey and the reward for his play was a 1995 All-Star Game appearance. Now, context is key, right? Well, the Sixers were a boo-boo that year. I mean, straight garbage. They had the fourth worst record in the league, but Barros, he was cooking dudes on a nightly basis. He dropped a 50-burger on the eventual champion Houston Rockets. Well, w don't take my burger. word for it. Just ask Kenny the Jet Smith. Dana Barros. <laughs> so he had his career high. He had 50 points. Okay. They, they gotta bring the show back. They, they, I remember the show. Um, when it was airing on NBA TV, it used to be my morning show, y'all. I remember it was out in middle school. Um, bus used to pick me up at 7.30. I'm eating cereal at 7, though. Um, and I'm watching that show with Isaiah Thomas, Shaq, Kenny. Chuck is on there. Reggie Miller's on there. Like, the crew is on there just reminiscing on the old days. We we need that type of, especially now in the podcast era, We need some. we need something like that, dog. Just like eight to to eight to, I don't even know, five to eight NBA legends just sitting down and talking about hoops back in the day. We need that back, bro. That show was ahead of his time. Against us. But after that mind-blowing season, things start to change for Barros. He signs a six-year, $21 million deal with his hometown Celtics and is never a full-time starter again. He never even plays Man. more than 30 minutes a game again. I mean, yeah, he's still a sharpshooter, but like I said, the league wasn't ready for what he could bring to the table. That just shows you how fast things change in the league. One minute you're an all-star, and the next you're a role player. All right, y'all, imagine Dana Barros in today's NBA. How would he stack up in an era where the three-pointer is king? Would he be another player, or would he be just as lethal behind the arc? Dana Barros' incredible season is a reminder that sometimes a player can be ahead of their time. His story let me let me let me see what he was putting up. Let me see what he was putting up. Dana Barrows. Dana Barrows. Twenty one points. God damn, forty six percent. Was this the year they shortened the line though? I, I don't know. But still, he was a sharp shooter throughout his whole career. Forty four point six right here. Twenty one and eight. I mean, a lot of the highlights too. It was looking like he was. And pull up Jays. 
Dana Barrows. Uh, today's league, if I if I just had to guesstimate, he'd be like a he'd be like a eighty two overall Darius Garland. Story isn't just about that one year. Nasty it's about a moment when the future of the game showed up a little. Nasty early. ass comparison. Picture this: an eighteen year old kid stepping straight out of high school into the Lakers spotlight. No, I'm not talking about Kobe Bryant. I'm talking about Andrew Bynum, a towering teen with a world of potential and a whole lot to prove. Bynum steps into the league as the youngest player to ever grace an NBA court. And yo, know, he is raw, but the Lakers make sure that he has all the resources to be great. And check this out. They even brought in Kareem to personally mentor and coach him. I think Andrew Bynum's gonna be uh, uh Bro, am I tripping on this? Cause every time I bring it up, like motherfuckers wanna gaslight me, but I swear to God, peak Andrew Bynum was like, the second best center in the league. Am I tripping? Am I like th there was a point in time where Dwight was Dwight. Dwight was Dwight. But after Dwight, Andrew Bynum was in the discussion, and it wasn't on some like the gap. I mean, the the gap was big, but it was like people respected Andrew Bynum as a talent too. Like all right, 20, 2012. 19 points, 12 rebounds, 2 blocks. That 08 season, he was already 13 and 10. He was he was already a walking double double damn near. But this season right here, 19, 12, and 2 blocks. Like, there was a like they legitimately considered Kobe, Pau Gasol, and Andrew Bynum as a legitimate big three. Stop gaslighting me. Stop gaslighting me, y'all. And I swear to God, it was it was. Not just that season. I'd like to look back at what the discussion was in 2010 too, but I don't know. I don't know. And this is when Tim Duncan was viewed as a power forward. I, I, I don't want to. Oh, what about Tim Duncan? I mean, Duncan was a son. Eat a cock, bro. A fine player. He's uh, got a lot to learn, but he understands that. Year after year, Bynum is getting better and better and his immaturity was turning into determination. He went from being this wide-eyed rookie getting fined by Phil Jackson to a vet who postponed surgery so he could help the Lakers win titles. And pretty soon after, that work and that focus would start to pay off. Fast forward to the 2011-2012 season, where Phil Jackson retires as coach for the Lakers and Mike Brown gets hired with one objective from the GM, Jim Buss. Get Andrew Bynum the dang ball. And that's exactly what happened. Bynum started getting more touches than he ever did before. And it turned... I remember when Mike Brown was a bad coach. I remember that. I remember that. Pe people didn't even put respect on Mike Brown's coaching when he was coaching LeBron. And those teams are like 60 to 66 wins, bro. Like, the way... the way. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way motherfuckers were talking about Mike Brown, he was just a defensive merchant. And it's ironic that, like, 14 years later, 15 years later... He is now like an office merchant, if anything, so. Turns out, those lessons from Kareem paid off because he dominated. My guy was a force in the paint. His strength, elite footwork in the post, and soft touch around the rim had defenses shook. And if he hits you with that deadly drop step, you might as well just count the bucket. Averaging nearly 19 points and 12 boards, Bynum makes his first and only all-star team and his only second team all-NBA. At this point, there were legit arguments. Is Bynum rivaling Dwight Howard for the title of the league's best big man? That season, Bynum wasn't just good, he was a revelation. But sometimes the basketball gods giveth and the basketball gods taketh away. And that's what happened to Bynum. He was traded to the Sixers, but never played a game for Philly because of chronic knee injuries. And Bynum's journey takes a hard turn. He had brief stints in Cleveland and Indiana, but just two years after his coming out party, he was out of the league. Some blame his attitude and immaturity, but truthfully, injuries ended a career that could have been great. And sometimes the attitude is warranted. Just think about it. Andrew Bynum came into the league as a kid, worked his butt off, sacrificed his body, and ultimately his career to win champion. If I'm looking down on my phone, YouTube, I need y'all to know. It's because this man Omar talking shit on Twitter like he ain't asked at 2K. I'm like, come on, bro. What are we, what are we doing? And, and Sage wants this rematch because I beat him. Like, hey, he's talking about, yeah, I need to train up because ain't no way that shit happening. Can I, can I just get one? Like, fuck. Can I just earn one, get one, and we move on? Like, goddamn. <laughs> Hit dogs hollering. Rawr, 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 rawr. Come on. Good chips. In the moment he really got a chance to show what he could do, his body failed him. Bynum had it all, talent, size, skill, and youth. He could have been an NBA legend, but sometimes 
things don't work out the way you want them to. Injuries in sports can be brutal, and Bynum's story is a harsh reminder of that reality. How old was he? NBA legend's kind of stretching it. 24? I mean, when you're first all-star, I, I had the same take about, like, Tatum, but when your first all-star season is at 24, year, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and it's not even, like, dominant, dominant for real, 19 and 12, eh, eh, future NBA legend, eh, I don't, I don't know, bro, I don't know. But hey, that that's that's the tough part about injuries. You you will never know. That's that's the tough part. They don't they don't get the benefit of the doubt. Well, sometimes they do, but it's a, it's a slippery slope. Sometimes the toughest battles in the league are more than physical. They're mental. And in the case of Larry Sanders, his story is more than just about hoops. It's about the mental game that plays off the court too. These days, you can catch Larry Sanders focusing on himself, his well-being, and his art. But in his prime, Sanders was like Picasso on defense, and you were honestly lucky if you could get a shot off around the rim. He's this energetic, athletic big man for the Milwaukee Bucks. He's the hype man on the roster, like that one song that gets you going before the game. Like the transition in the Dreams and Nightmares intro, that's <laughs> his role. And then comes 2012, and Sanders Damn. starts turning heads. This dude is playing incredible. Ben Wallace type defense, I mean truly redefining the game. He's athletic enough to switch out on wings, and if you get near the hoop, well, he's protecting the rim like it's his personal property. He's averaging nearly three blocks per game and putting up a double-double on a daily basis. But then- I do remember those conversations vaguely. Ben Wallace type defense, is he gassing it? I, I don't remember the conversations well enough, but I, I do remember like Larry Sanders defense being gassed the fuck up though. Things started getting rocky, and I mean, yeah, injuries did hit, but it was more than that. Sanders started dealing with off the court issues. The pressure of being an NBA star starts consuming him and he faces multiple suspensions for smoking weed to cope. The game that used to be his escape is becoming a weight. This is where Sanders' story takes a deeper turn. We talk about the physical injuries in the sport, but the mental game? That's a whole different thing. For Sanders, the mental battle started outweighing the physical one. It's a reminder that these players are more than athletes. They're humans first. I didn't feel like a human. I felt more like a product in a lot of ways, like, you know, and very disposable. So even with all the fame, Sanders steps away from the game during what should have actually been his prime. He's been open about his struggles with anxiety and depression, and suddenly this isn't about basketball anymore. It's about a dude who found the strength to capture his peace and balance by defying everyone else's expectations and creating his own. And that makes Larry Sanders legendary in his own right, proving that his story is so much bigger than a game. From one big man's story to another, let's talk oh, about Roy whoa, Hibbert. Whoa, whoa. Not, not too much. Not too much. That's a hey, not too much. That's friend of the show, Roy Hibbert. Now, not too much. That's that's NBA top seventy-five, Roy Hibbert. Now, not too much. Not too much on my friend, Roy Hibbert. This is insane. His tale is about this how is quickly insane. the NBA can change and how tough it can be to keep up. Nah, he played just not too much now. Not too much. Hibbert's game was like playing Atari in a world where PS5s exist. When Hibbert hit the league, he was not too much. Not too much. He was this towering presence for the Pacers, a classic 7'2", 270 pound Georgetown big man in the mold of Ewing, Matumbo, and Mourning. A big who could own the paint and be a real defensive powerhouse. I mean, look at this. This dude was like a wall. Hey. You come in the paint and you're getting stopped. In the early 2010s, that was the game and Hibbert was becoming one of the best. Look at his peak. From 2012 to 2014, Hibbert makes a couple all-star teams by mastering the rule of verticality. And his Pacers teams with Paul George and Lance Stevenson were locked into playoff battles with LeBron in the Heat every year. Hibbert's old school back to the basket game was working and the Pacers were contenders and Roy was a huge reason why. And then something happened in 2014. He makes the all-star team, but the second half of the season, he falls off a cliff. I mean, look at his numbers. Before the 2014 all-star game, Hibbert was playing elite defense and averaging nearly 12 points and eight boards i think roy roy was rudy gobert before rudy gobert that that, that that's what roy sh shout out to roy man but the way people talk about rudy gobert it sounds something like i mean cool on defense but at a certain point you're not doing shit on offense and like your defense ain't even like dominant for real like for real for real when it matters um God, i remember people like cooking roy hibbert for some of the stat lines he was putting up like, oh my God, is this our starting center? And it'll be like seven, seven, six in a block. Like, oh, brother. But 
per game. In the 26 games after the break, he was down to 9 points and 5 rebounds. And in the playoffs, he got exposed. The Atlanta Hawks used sharpshooting bigs to pull Hibbert away from the basket, and he just could not play in the space. Although the Pacers won that series, Atlanta gave the league a blueprint. And here's where the record skips. The NBA starts shifting fast. I mean, really fast. We're talking the rise of the three ball in smaller and faster lineups. The yeah, that 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 switch. And low-key, it started with how the Spurs dominated in the finals. Because if y'all if y'all remember, like, the Spurs were ringing fucking threes against the Heat. And this was still when... Yo, do, do y'all... This, this is how crazy, like, NBA conversations change. Do y'all remember when... People were saying three-point shooting teams can't win championships. You don't remember that, bro? Now, now look at now look at where we are. But yeah, from 2013 to 14 to 14, 15. 14, 15 is when that change really happened. But then when the draft came around, people were still kind of eh, maybe it's just a one-time fluky year. So then Jaleel Okafor still went third. But then the second season, uh, next season came around. And people are like, oh no, this is um this is here to stay, right? <laughs> oh fuck. Okay, the, the league is just okay, this is this is the norm. And Jaleel Okafor got cooked. I always feel bad for my guy Jaleel, man. God, just, that's one of those that's one of those uh wrong right right player in the wrong era type player, man. The game got quick and spacey. He's my son of Dana Barrow. Amber style of play was like keeping a VHS player in a streaming world. He just didn't fit in. It's tough watching a player who was dominating suddenly struggle to find his place. But Roy could just never adapt. And by 2017, he was out of the league. A perfect example of a big who was able to adapt is Brooke, Brooke Lopez. Lopez. And that could have been Hibbert if he learned to step outside and take a jumper. But for Bro Brooke Lopez's player progression is so interesting because I remember back in the day, Brooke Lopez being one of the, like the, the poster child of Two blocks a game doesn't mean you're a great defender, right? Brooke, Brooke Lopez also could not shoot back in the day. But for him to progress his career, and Al Horford did the same thing too. Al Horford was not viewed as his defensive juggernaut um, in Atlanta. But now he has aged into being one of the best defenders and not not like DPOY level but like a, a very very integral defensive piece to one of the best defensive teams in the league for the last couple of years like an Embiid stopper a Giannis stopper one might say right I don't uh, I don't know who would say that but yeah say, same thing with Brooke Lopez dog like never never s did not see if, if you were to tell me in 2010 when Brooke Lopez was on the nets that number one he would still be playing in 2024, number two would be a depoy caliber player. Um, and number three would be like a stretch big. I'd be like, oh, you're bugging. You're you're actually crazy. You're actually crazy. Now, Hibbert's journey is just a cautionary tale of how fast the game evolves and the adaptability it demands. The next player on our list is a true story of never running away from the grind. Mike James' path to the league is so much more different than anyone else on this list. We're talking about a dude who went undrafted and had to play in the Continental Basketball Association, also known as the CBA, then went to Europe. Damn, Mike James was CBA building his game brick CBA. by brick away from the bright lights of the NBA. Most dudes make their NBA debut around 20 years old, but James stepped on the court for the first time at 26. That's a different level of grind. He played for the Heat and the Celtics before winning a title with the 04 Pistons. Then he had stints with the Bucks and Rockets. But that's five teams in five seasons, and he's never put up more than 12 points per game. Then the 05 06 season rolls around, and Mike James lands with the Toronto Raptors. That, outside of a young Chris Bosch, they didn't really have a whole lot of talent. So Mike James did what any of us would do. He started shooting the ball. He completely redefined himself that season. He went from being a role player to a primary scorer. His scoring efficiency skyrocketed. My guy is shooting a career high 47% from the field and 44% from three while averaging over 20 a game. That Dang. season, he was more than just a scorer too. He was really the offensive cornerstone. A quarter of the team's possessions were running through him. Yet while he's shining bright, the team is famously hot garbage. Chat, who, who's some of them fake shooters that like Gain the reputation for being a shooter, for being a great shooter for a couple years, but like on average, they wasn't like that for real. From the three, 
I got a name in mind that maybe actually is still solid, but let me look up Davis Bertans. Okay, he's still he's still decent. He's still decent. Actually. So so th this is this is what I'm talking about though. Like they that twenty twenty season where Bertans is on the wizard motherfuckers is gassing him up. <sighs> yeah, that's the next JJ Reddick right there. Fifteen points a game too. Yeah, that's JJ Bertans. And then he goes like and has this season right here where he's shooting thirty two percent from three. Like, are you are you really a shooter for real? Or did you just have a couple of runs? Another one? Yup, this th this right here is exactly what I'm talking about. Max fucking Struess. Made a name being a sharpshooter. Oh, he's better than Duncan Robinson, y'all. Last season, 35%. And we're back this season, 35%. In the playoffs, 33-32. Max Struess is not like that for real. He is, he's from the three. Now his athleticism, I've seen a couple clips of, of, of Max Struess this year. Max Struess is actually as athletic as fuck, but that three ball, which is how he made his fucking money, he not really liked that for real, dog. And, and people wanted to, you know what I'm saying, cook cook my Celtics for passing up on Max Struess. When we found Max Struess, when we found what Max Struess is supposed to be, his name is Sam Hauser, a real shooter, a real shooter. A real 43, 42, 42. Oh, <laughs> a real shooter. Yeah, big, big Hauser. Big Hauser. Not too much now. This is the very same Raptors team that Kobe dropped 81 on. So, yeah, Mike James got some of that smoke too. After that season, James signed a four-year, $23.5 million contract with the Timberwolves, but he never really had the same opportunity to be the offensive engine. From team to team, his role fluctuates. The minutes he was getting in Toronto and that green light he had on offense, it ain't there no more. In Minnesota, he's not the main guy. When he plays for Washington- I need y'all to know, Omar now has a space about 2K now. Omar has a space about 2K now trying to cook me. Cause he's he's trying to say I'm not all that because I off ball and I run plays. But mind you, this is the same dude who said the game can't be played the right way on Hall of Fame. And primarily it's because you can make whites on superstar. Talk about letting the game decide for you. All right, dog. In New Orleans and Chicago, his role changes even more from primary scorer to veteran guide and support system. What's crazy about Mike James's career is how it mirrors the NBA's evolution. The league is shifting. We're getting more star-centric teams, three-point shooting, and faster-paced offenses. And theoretically, James should fit in, but he never really did like he did in Toronto. That's the challenge of adapting to new systems and new teammates so often. When your role on the team is redefined every year, it's very hard to find consistency. And that's the dilemma that Mike James found himself in his entire career. But Mike James' story is much more than that. It's about seizing opportunities and shining when that spotlight finds you. His season with the Raptors is a highlight reel in a career that saw so many changes. And he showed us that adapting to change is a skill in itself. Mike James scraped, fought, and earned that season. And I think that's a grind we can all respect. And now, as we head towards the climax of our NBA One Hit Wonders, there it's only go. right we end with a Mike Green. Bang! There you go! Let's talk about the legend of Linsanity. Y'all, when Jeremy Lin burst onto the scene with the Knicks, it was more than a hot streak. It was a cultural phenomenon. Check this out. Jeremy Lin came into the league as an undrafted player out of Harvard. Yes, that Harvard. Not too Lin much, spent now. time in the G League, and when he was in the NBA, he mostly rode the bench. I mean, I think Jeremy Lin is still like a superstar in China, though, like dead ass. Like, I've seen his Instagram lately. He moving like a guy who still has pull, like for real, for real, so. Let's keep it a stack. The expectations for a guy like Lin were set in the bottom of the barrel. No one, and I mean no one, could have seen what was coming. Then, February 2012 hits, and Lin goes from the end of the Knicks bench to center stage. And suddenly, dude's got the Midas touch. On February 4th, Lin Sanity begins when Jeremy drops 25, 7, and 5 on Deron Williams. Well, if a one game sample size wasn't enough, how'd he do the next game? Well, he drops 28 and 8, and then the Knicks rattle off seven straight dubs after that. 
and after a while, the entire sports world knows the name Jeremy Lin. During this wild stretch, Lin was doing more than hooping. He was rewriting narratives, whether it was dropping game winners against Toronto or putting up 36 on the Mamba's head in Madison. That game winner against Toronto was cold, dog. Now, mind you, Kyrie hit that same shot. Tor Toronto is just a, a city for game winners. That's what I figured out. <laughs> Madison Square Garden, you couldn't go anywhere in New York without seeing Jeremy Lin. And we're talking about a dude who was couch surfing on his brother's couch and wasn't even included in the Knicks media guy. Lin's sanity wasn't just a phase, it was a movement. Mike D'Antoni likes smart guards who play with tempo, so Lin thrived in D'Antoni's pick and roll heavy offense. So his ability to get downhill and make quick decisions made him perfect for the system. Like Steve Nash and James Harden, D'Antoni's offense made Lin sanity a star. In his 12 starts before the All-Star break, the Knicks were 9-3 and, and Lin was averaging 22-9. and nine. And there were even talks about him playing in the All-Star game. But here's the kicker. By March, Mike D'Antoni was replaced with Mike Woodson, so yeah. the pick-and-roll offense was dead. That same offense that was allowing Jeremy Lin to succeed before. And on top of that, Carmelo Anthony and Amar- But I will say that I, I think that's the fault with Jeremy Lin, is that if you need a specific system to succeed in the NBA, it's kind of grits. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Specifically when you know, like, you're probably going to regress. And, and, with all the respect, especially with Melo on the team, like, now, you're not about to be the first option over Melo. You know, like. And I, I think it was a case of, I mean, that's all Jeremy Lin wanted, to be honest with you, was just to be a solid role player in the league. But I think it exposes weaknesses, so. Ari Stoudemire came back from injury, and Lin tore his meniscus and missed the Knicks playoff run. Yeah. As fast as Lin's sanity exploded, it started to cool off. He signed a poison pill contract in Houston, and coincidentally, the Rockets traded for James Harden that same summer. Harden and Lynn were both ball-dominant, pick-and-roll heavy players, and Kevin McHale made the correct decision to run the offense through Harden. He never quite fit in with the Rockets, even after being replaced in the starting yeah. lineup by Patrick Beverly. Lynn had a few more solid seasons. He had a decent season in Charlotte and Brooklyn, I think. But, um, excuse me. But, yeah, outside of that, I mean, he was a role player. He was a role player. I think I think what Lin Sanity did was just put Jeremy Lin on. And um I think even even still, yes, he didn't end up being that Asian superstar that we all wanted him to be, that I wanted him to be at least. Um, let alone a star. Or not let alone a star, but he, he didn't end up being a star. But I think what Jeremy Lin and Lin Sanity did for him was put him on the map. Gave him a couple years of teams saying, Hey, we can make Jeremy Lin work. We we see what he could do. Extended his career, and then after that, it was on some, okay, he's not going to be a star, but he could be a solid point guard for us, and extended his career even more. So, yeah, that, that hey, it changed his life. It, that, that, those two weeks changed his life for him. But it was never the same. Sometimes you can't quite catch lightning in a bottle twice. But that moment in time was bigger than basketball. Lin Sanity shattered stereotypes, became an icon for millions, and proved that some of the league's most exciting stories can come from the most unexpected places. He showed all of us that all it takes is the right place, the right time, and a little bit of raw talent to transcend the game. The Lin Sanity era reminds us that the underdog is still alive. And dang, they can leave a mark. One hit wonders. From Michael Carter Williams' rookie magic to the frenzy of insanity, these stories weren't just about basketball. They were about moments that defy expectations, make people's dreams come true, and ignite passions throughout the whole NBA world. Think about it. In the NBA, legends aren't always built over years. Sometimes they flash bright in a single season, leaving a legacy that keeps us talking. That's yeah. the beauty of this game. The thrill of- Yeah, I mean, listen, I said this in my last video, like, I, I'm sorry. But everyone can't be MJ. Everyone can't be Kobe. Everyone can't be Tim Duncan. Every, everyone can't be T-Mac. Everyone can't be Paul Pierce. You know what I'm saying? Like, there, there's certain roles in the story that need to be fulfilled. Someone got to be Michael Red. Right? So, someone has to be um, Dana Barrows. Someone has to be Gilbert Arenas. Someone has to, and not too much on Gil, but hey. So I'm saying, someone has to be Steven Jackson. Someone has to be... You know what I'm saying? Someone has to be uh, Rick Smith. You know, not not everyone. Like, there's a lot of players in the league that, hey, they show glimpses, but that's all it's going to be, and that's fine. That's fine. Uh, with that being said, though, shout out to um, Lockdown K again for the video. Big Lockdown K. I'm very, very big fan of his work. All really good videos. Um, he's already at 16K. On his way up. A lot of very quality videos. But with that being said, I'm going to catch y'all later, man.
Peace. Bye.